Hi, this is O'Connor. I did say I was going to do a recap on some of the more difficult questions that you encountered in last week's quiz. And in the process, we'll go over some of the key areas, key frameworks that we have covered this semester. As you know, we started off with this whole wheel from the macro point of view where we looked at COVID and the sourcing shift, but then we got into how do we actually manage suppliers for SMEs, small, medium sized enterprises and startups. And we looked at that three circle control framework. We are structuring the relationship, then legal documentation, and then the whole idea of measurement and verification of the quality. More recently in the semester, post quiz, we started to tackle issues such as how do multinationals, large multinationals manage their supply chains? And it's a totally different kettle of fish. So let's have a look at some of these key questions and the areas of the first two thirds of the unit that were covered. Our first question that students struggled with was this notion of what is a trading company? Now it is okay to buy from a trading company. I advise buyers do buy from a trading company to get used to the type of product that you want to source and sell on Amazon, for example. And under in other words, get to know your downstream market, your downstream customers. Try to understand them first before you try and perfect your upstream management of suppliers. And a trading company is a good way to start with that. Of course, they're going to charge you 20% more, but they take the risk of finding a dodgy supplier. They take the risk of you getting a poor quality product. Isn't that worth paying for the extra 20% and making smaller margin, but making sure that you are developing your brand in your downstream markets? So the question was, how do you know if a supplier is a trading company? And the answer was, when they cannot give you their exact factory address or let you go visit their factory. Obviously, it's more either a scam or a trading company. Because what I do tell buyers, that is, if you do not want to deal with a trading company and you want to go direct, go and visit the factory yourself. That's the only way you can be 100% sure that you are not dealing with a trading company. This was the first part of the three circle control framework where we talked about structuring of the relationship. And training companies may be represented like on this website here where they have a whole variety of products. Now, this one is an actual example of a scam. We looked at it in week five, but you can imagine a trading company can trade in all sorts of products and not just be on a single line. So just keep that in mind when you're dealing with a trading company. It is okay to deal with a trading company if it's part of your strategy. Next question. Audit quality inspection. Which of the following is correct about the AQL limit? Now the AQL stands for acceptable quality limit. And the answer was a higher AQL limit for a minor defect versus a major defect. In other words, you have greater allowance for having shoddy products go through your inspection if the problem is only minor compared to the allowance if the problem is major. Where did that come from? Well, in the three circle control framework, we have measurement and verification area. What does that mean? Well, this was the rubric that you work through. In other words, the tables, first of all, determining how much sample size you need to select based on the total order, and then going into just behind me, the actual sampling plan. But notice just above me here, that is 2.5% for major defects, 4% for minor defects. Invariably, you're always going to have a greater allowance for a larger number of defects if they are minor and still accept the total shipment. So which of the following is correct? Of course, it is A, a higher AQL limit 
is for the minor versus the major defects. Next question, documentation. This is the other part of the three circle control framework. What is the golden rule for aligning your contract, order and payments? Well, the golden rule was the same Chinese name on the contract, bank account and factory bank and factory gate, sorry. What do I mean by that? Well, what we learned was this was the second circle and three circle control framework where, and if I step back from this, you notice there's the purchase order, due diligence, intellectual property, warranty, ADR clauses. But we did do talk about contracts and payments. And if you look just down around here, you'll notice that it's important to have the same name on the contract, the bank account and the factory gate. That is the best way to guarantee that you are dealing with a rigid supplier and that is your payment is going to go to the right entity for your shipment. Next question. This was about the supply competitive market model. What are we talking about here? Well, I'll show you in a minute, but the question was in the supply competitive market model, in what ways do competitive pressures impact on the supplier's profitability? So you want to think about these answers. When forced into competition, suppliers will compromise. Well, that's a supplier response and it's not very clear about the competitive pressure. All right. If they compromise, that is that's going not going to affect the profitability because they're passing it on by giving you cheaper quality goods. Next one, the supplier will come forward to invest in the facilities in order to press the buyer. That's really not going to help the supplier's margins. Actually, it will squeeze the margin, but that's not a real direct immediate response to a competitive pressure. That's more of a long term strategic plan by a really high end thinking supplier. Next one, margins are squeezed by the need to spend on extra training, extensive marketing and capital investment. Absolutely, because in order to keep up with the competitive pressures, suppliers need to spend more on training. Why? Because their employees may go to a competitor if the competitor is offering higher wages, better conditions. So therefore, you have to pay high wages yourself. That directly affects your margins. Extensive marketing your competitor may be marketing their brand more. So now you have to spend more money marketing your brand more. That's going to affect your marketing and your margins. Finally, capital investment. Your competitors are investing in machinery. So you may have to invest in your own processes as well. That's going to affect your margin. So you can see that the answer C was very, very specific in terms of the way competitive pressures is going to impact on the supplier's profitability. But what was the model we were talking about? And this was the model here. It's not very clear here, but at the top you have foreign entrants and foreign customers. And they are putting pressure on the supplier by themselves being in China and actually giving training opportunities to their employees. So therefore your employees also want training opportunities. They're actually marketing more on their brand. So therefore you're forced to do marketing yourself. And these pressures is what you causes you as a supplier to spend more on training, on marketing and other things. So that impacts on your margins in that way in order to keep up with the Joneses. In other words, in order to keep up with the competition. So that was the answer to number four. Number five, what were the three different ways in which foreign international customers place pressure on suppliers? And I've just shown you that in the framework, tighter margins, monitoring and contracts. And that's how they actually put pressure on suppliers. And it's very important what we learned from the competitive market model was that if you didn't monitor and if you didn't focus on helping the supplier improve their processes, they may go out and actually get cheaper materials. They may go out and skimp on the quality. They may go out and get parts from your competitors suppliers and pay them margin like what we happened with that QQ car. OK, what about post COVID-19 trends? Which of the following is not 
a global supply chain trend post COVID-19? And the answer was lesser incentive for online platforms to be responsible for substandard and non-compliant products. What do we mean here? Well, obviously there's greater incentive for online platforms to be responsible. And it's obviously, what are we talking about here? Well, we did talk about that, the pressures that the trade war and COVID-19 put on companies around the world. First of all, they put a lot of uncertainty pressure on suppliers and companies, on brands. Multinationals are able to absorb that uncertainty and to continue with their long-term strategy to actually focusing on driving innovation and change with their supplier base. SMEs, on the other hand, smaller companies, they may not have had that luxury or the flexibility to actually continue on their innovation and change strategy. And for the most part, SMEs may have had to, number one, change their product, or number two, scale down the orders from a particular country, or number three, close up altogether in a particular country and move to another country. So we talked about these issues that have been pushed on by post-COVID-19 trends. On a side note, we talked about compliance in the top 10 trends. And what this question is asking, that is, which of the following is not a global supply chain trend post COVID? Well, A, diversification of sourcing of pharmaceuticals and food products. Obviously, there's greater diversification needed because borders are closed and supply chains are at bottlenecks and you can't always get imports of food like you could three years ago. So more likely you're going to be more reshoring of food and pharmaceuticals in some countries in Europe, Australia, USA. B, greater devotion to stress testing, of course, because supply chains are not as flexible as we thought they were. You have gyrations of demand and supply and shipping causing bottlenecks and that is existing today. And so therefore there's great devotion to stress testing based on our supply chains we have around the world. If things were to get worse, uh, where are we sourcing from? Can we supplement that with an alternative source? That's what we mean by stress testing. So that is obviously a post COVID-19 global supply chain trend. C, SMEs reassess relocation of factories and delay new investments. Obviously that has been happening. So is that, that is obviously a post COVID-19 trend. But D, lesser incentive for online platforms, is actually there is more incentive for online platforms to be responsible for the substandard and non-compliant products. Product compliance is obviously going to get stronger and there's going to be more focus on the importers of record than there ever has been in the last decade going forward. Finally, consolidation of supplies. Obviously, that is a strategy that companies are considering too post COVID-19. Obviously, having lots and lots of supplies gives you flexibility, but you need to trade that off with having a good relationship with a fewer number of suppliers. So very interesting, this list is very, it's a great lesson for us to take away for the first two weeks in this unit. Okay, legal documentation, and we're nearly finished this review of questions that you had trouble with. Legal documentation, question 21. What is the sequence of escalation in enforcing a contract with a supplier? What are we talking about here? Well, the real sequence is obviously you want to bang on the door, you pay me or you take my goods back and give me a refund. Like you can bang all you like and they may not do anything. Or next you can, I'll take you to court if you don't pay me back. Well, there are things in between that and that's what we're trying to show here. What are we talking about? Well, we're in this second circle of the three circle control framework due diligence, legal documentation, and I showed you about all of these issues. But to be more specific, we were looking at how we could escalate a problem. First of all, a letter of demand. Now, that doesn't always work in emerging economies where the institutional 
fabric of the legal system is different from Western developed societies. So what can you do? Well, you build into your contract mediation and arbitration clauses. And that's where you need to develop the relationship in that first circle so you can get your buyer, so you can get your supplier to agree to a mediation and arbitration clause in the contract. And why you sell these clauses is that a mediation is an informal way of discussing differences of a dispute that each party may have. An arbitration is a more formalized version of trying to resolve the problem, but at the same time, trying to keep the identity of the parties private. Because you don't want to go to litigation at the last resort, because that's when the identification of the parties becomes public and you lose any recourse of going back to the relationship afterwards. And you've got to be careful if you do that too much, then you may actually have a bad brand or reputation in that country and the work can get around a specific supply chain network. So you've got to be careful. Mediation arbitration are ways that you can build into the contract to actually avoid those problems of litigation. So there you go. There's a relationship, there's costs involved. You've got to think about the time and also, of course, the alignment of what's in the best party's interest for resolving these problems. That's what we did talk about in week five. Okay, so the question, what is the sequence of escalation? Of course, it's C, that is, you, of course, letter of demand, but next is mediation, then arbitration, and then finally, if that doesn't work, then litigation. E is not correct because you don't go from letter of demand to litigation and then the mediation. Mediation, again, is the informal discussion of that problem with a mediator involved. All right, so you want to do that before litigation and not escalate to mediation after litigation. It's too late. You cannot go back and mediate or arbitrate after you've gone through a litigation process. Finally, sourcing shift. What are the plausible motivations for an American company to stay in China? Now remember, in week two, we talked about the 17 motivations of companies who were leaving China. The answer here was all of the above. Why would you stay in China? The products require labor intensive manufacturing processes. The products may require a highly manual process, especially for higher mix and lower quality orders. And the products where consisting of the quality is less relevant. So consisting of the quality is less relevant, then it's better to stay in a, an emerging economy where quality is always less anyway than in a developed economy when you're sourcing from a developed economy. So all of the above are reasons why you may want to stay in China. What do we mean here? Well, this is what we showed in week two, and we talked about how companies were moving to different countries when they were moving capacity out of China. What we did document here, just for summary purposes, of course, is we've got 150 total moves of 108 companies. 54 of those moves were to Vietnam alone. The other half of the 108 companies, other 54, have gone to other countries around the world. And of course, Southeast Asia being dominating, USA not so many, Mexico dominating, India dominating, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, Taiwan also dominating in recipient of sourcing shift from China. So, there you have it, the answer. What are the plausible motivations? Obviously, A, B, and C are all plausible motivations for not moving out of China. What we did document was 17 reasons for why we want to move out of China. And some of those were grouped into three parts. One is China-based reasons where the costs 
of labor going up in China, xenophobic risk going up in China, other political risk going up in China. There were country recipient reasons where Vietnam would give tax incentives. They would actually give other incentives for locating a particular economic zone in their country. And of course, there were trade war and political reasons. That is, you were shipping to USA and you wanted to avoid the 15% tariff that may have been placed on your product or 20% or 25% tariffs in some sectors. So there you have it. There we have eight questions that students struggle with. And it's best that we go over these eight because they cover a lot of the topical areas that we did cover in the first seven weeks of this unit. This is O'Connor and thank you once again for giving me your attention and learning this great content in this unit. Bye for now.